Hey guys, Freaky Finance here. The last video was the long shot for AST Space Mobile. Today we're going to take it back to China for a fun one. This one took a bit to read through. It's called Lix and Fintech. It's kind of an obscure <laughs> fintech play in China. <laughs> we've done not, not really anything like this degree of complexity, um, but we've seen similar one when we did like the Stone Co video. Usually the juxta the matter is you're lending money to somebody and you're borrowing from somebody to lend that money to somebody else. So <clears throat> usually there's a funding cost and then there's the end user that you're lending to and you're kind of the middleman. Banks are a little bit different mainly because they have deposits and then they'll lend those out to entrepreneurs or whatever mortgages, whatever, whatever they decide to originate. Anyway, usually if you can figure out the source of funding and you can figure out who the end user is, you can kind of see the business model. It, it's not, well, they all pretend to be very weak. It's very old school in that <laughs> thinking. It's, it's kind of what's required in this business model to work. If you can get those two things and the way to change them, then it can be beneficial. Now, normally what I like to do with banks and with fintech is when the credit spreads shoot up, or not the credit spreads, rather the provisions for credit shoot up, that's usually my buy signal, as long as the business can obviously tolerate that type of move. So usually big banks, the, the biggest banks, are usually the, the best ones when that happens. Now, anyway, that's a little preamble on, on the business. I, so I, I have started a position in this one, and I kind of just showed some of the banks that started to win TD as well. I might do a video on that at some point. Um, but yeah, we did the Stoke, Stone Cold one in Brazil, and that's the one that kind of reminds me a bit of that one was that we, we had the inflation. Obviously, China doesn't have the same inflation that Brazil had, um, or the rest of the world had, for that matter. But China, or Brazil had this uh, inflation spike, and then we knew their their source of funding was floating, so we knew they were getting squeezed on this initial hike up in interest rates. Well, their um, assets, so the asset side, but the loan side, was still resetting high over time. So we knew eventually they'd catch up. And then once the interest rates started coming back down, we actually did the margin for an expand. That's kind of how we played Stone Co., which is still slowly playing out over time. And the business itself has performed better. Um, but we'll see how their new going back into credit lending goes. <laughs> this company is all about credit lending. So that is, it's different than Stone Co., what we were trying to do, which is uh, interest rate differentials. But anyway, let, let's try to get into it. it it's it's going to be a longer video. I tried to make it shorter, but it's just uh, it's complicated. And I'm already cutting it a lot out. Really, the user profile is young. Um, we'll go through the business, but it's 24 to 40 year olds in China. Some of these guys are straight out of university, so they have very little credit history, um, which is generally a riskier person to lend to. So obviously younger, so they're riskier. And then because they have limited employment history, also riskier. I don't know how they're going to handle their credit, right? how quickly they can pay it off, etc. This screen, if you look at it, the screen is very cheap, uh, but no matter what you kind of use. So generally at the top, yeah, it does pay. Well, we'll go into the pros and cons are there's a lot of pros and cons here but really the probably the biggest pro is that this company's price like it's going away <laughs> i think a part of it's because it's hard to know the credit risk on the off balance sheet loans so this one is not as easy to understand as stone co was um but i i feel like i gotta do this video because i don't I'm look back in two years and like oh yeah this was easy easily a no-brainer or it was a uh, what were you thinking <laughs> why would you get involved <laughs> And it, it's, 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 I'm still on the fence, but I, I think this is at least an exciting time to look at it, especially after everyone else has been eviscerated owning it. Um, <laughs> when you see an org chart like this, you gotta be like, oh no, <laughs> especially for a company that's worth so little, or at least so little now. It's, and this is basically just a foreshadowing of what this call is gonna be like. It's a, it's a complicated business. Um, obviously on the onshore side, just trying to side. And then for tax purposes, you have Hong Kong, it's a Cayman. So <laughs> in terms of the breakdown of operating revenue, so the three segments, we're going to focus on one segment, which is the yellow one here. It's 78% of uh, revenue, which is the credit-driven platform services. So they do have about 30% or 22% of the revenue, technology-driven, installment-driven, but we're going to focus on the credit-driven part. Um, just for frame of reference, part of this technology-driven one is they empower financial institutions by providing cutting-edge proprietary technology solutions to meet their financial digital transformation, aka some of this revenue that's in this technology-driven one is from some of their funders um, who decide to also hire them for some type of technology help. 
<laughs> it's kind of how I view it. We don't have to worry about this part because if we get this part right or wrong, it's not going to matter because 75% of the business is this one. So for the purpose of today's video, we're just going to focus on the card-driven side or else the video is going to be way too long. It's already going to be overly complicated. And a part of that's just a reflection of me not being able to explain something easy enough because it is a little bit harder to wrap your hand around. 181, they kind of start talking about the business model more and basically what I view this company as is we effectively connect financial institutions with consumers through technology and financial services, offering convenient and speedy financial services to the younger generation in China. So think of it kind of like a matchmaker. So they'll get this funding from off balance sheet and they will originate and lend to a kid or <laughs> someone between 24 and 40 in China. And it, depending on the structure, they're taking most of the credit risk for most of the things. So if it goes belly up, um, this company is on the hook for that. And that's kind of the business model they have aligned. So obviously it's probably, it's probably a way for the funders um, to set a step aside to still get some return on whatever they're currently getting directly. It's also a way to distance themselves, say, from riskier lending, which th this would probably be, right? So again, the main segment we're going to focus on is the credit facilitation service one. Now they kind of claim again that they're serving the underserved consumers on their FinCool platform to match consumers with various credit profiles with financial institutions. Again, matchmaker. They do um, customer acquisition, so obviously finding the customer, and then also preliminary credit screening, and then also maintaining and collecting on the loans. That's kind of how I view it, kind of like a matchmaker setup. We're going to just skip the tech empowerment and installment service. Again, it's uh, 13 and 12% of the revenue base. If you want, you can freeze frame here and read it. In terms of the users, you can see here they have 210, registered, 210 million registered users, among whom 85% are age 23 to 40. And over 65% are working population in the urban area. And there's some, they, they kind of say that there's some cross selling between their initial lending and sometimes they'll come back for installment e commerce lending. But again, just, just kind of get the point of view of who the user is of this product. This was on the last call. And this is probably the biggest takeaway in terms of who, who exactly are they targeting, where, where exactly is this product um, being used. And you can see that they're charging 23.7% in Q4 2023 per year APR. So again, very high interest rate. <laughs> so view this as like bridge finance. And this is like equivalent to credit card lending in Canada, at least in, I explain, most in the US. It's a relatively high credit rate. So obviously it's in the client for the user's best interest to pay off whatever debt they've had to borrow relatively quickly, <laughs> right? Because the credit uh, rate is so high, it's very easy for them, or very easy for the company to also get into trouble because maybe they lend to somebody who can't afford to pay 23% a year, right? 24% a year. What else? The other thing to keep in mind is that these loans are very short term. So we're talking like bridge financing. So their average now has gone from 13.9 months to 12.3 months. Um, now, technically, the lower duration, the lower the risk. This is very short term lending. So it's like someone young needs some money today. Maybe they're waiting for a real loan from a bank, right? And they've got to bridge it for now. So they pay a higher interest rate so they can buy what they want and then they'll switch it off once this. And once it gets their 12.3 months average duration, they're out and they get an actual loan from the bank once they have some credit history, right? That's kind of how I view this. It's kind of like a niche, short-term, high interest charge business model. So really it's going to come down to how much money are they making and then the credit risk they're taking as well as the funding cost. So we'll go into it later, but if you needed one part for this business model, just imagine you're lending at 23.7% and you're borrowing at around 6%. Okay? So that, that's kind of the spread you know, we're talking about. So it is very lucrative as long as they can do it right. And that's always a hard question to ask. And again, we'll go through why it's kind of convoluted, partially because it's offshore lending and we don't actually know who the funders are. So we also have a hard time forecasting what the future funding cost would be. And um, we also don't know how bad the credit reserves could get, right? How, how bad is the underwriting? Or how good it is, right? If it's on the good side. But that's kind of like the key, the key business model is getting a good spread, but there's obviously some people are not going to be able to afford that and they're going to default. Now there's a little bit more involved. Obviously, they actually have to find the people. The online advertising, they do text messaging supported by uh, Doyen and WeChat. In terms of the institutional customers and partners, really it's the funding. So what I was trying to find here is who is actually funding this company, <laughs> which I do not have an answer. 
whereas with Brazil, they kind of linked it to floaters of the government, um, where the first don't go. Where here it was kind of like, I, I still don't know, I just know that it's a lot of funding. <laughs> so you can see here in 2023, institutional funding accounted for 100% of newly funded loans. So this company relies heavily on external financing from some institutions in China. <laughs> and we don't technically know who they are. Or at least I couldn't find out in an easy way. I'm sure it's probably some of the bigger banks in China, I would imagine, but I don't know that. <laughs> I mean, they're the reason why they don't disclose them. Again, I don't know. So that was kind of frustrating. They do like to say that they have 150 funding partners, but we'll go into the concentration. There's actually two that represent 70% of their funding. So that's another kind of red flag on the funding thing. If something were to happen to those guys, they are critical to this business model. And we don't know who they are. <laughs> Or at least I couldn't ascertain with a degree of certainty anyway. As of today's date, maybe that can change. If it does, I'll try to update it in the comments. But what else is there? So this is probably also an interesting thing that's happening with the business. So here you can see a standing principal balance going up, which in a, a bank size good, that's assets you're lending out. Um, so that's growth. However, you can see it's being entirely financed by off balance sheet loans. See that it's going from 81 to 119. This is an Arminbi. And then you can see the on balance sheet low is pretty much flat to down, right? So really all the growth is being driven by off balance sheet loans. So they get your money from founder A or funder A and they're lending it out to these um, students or younger, younger people in China at relatively high rates. Now, one of the things that's interesting is the average active users who used our loan products is dropping. So while they keep saying they have more and more people finding out the actual average users dropping down, so, but the loan book is growing. So that means on average, the person is borrowing more money, an individual person is borrowing more money. <laughs> now this could be good and bad. It's obviously from a concentration risk, it could be bad um, if someone that you're letting to becomes too big for you. Um, but at the same time, in terms of scale of our business, um, because you're lending less, um, or you're lending more, but to less people, it's actually a scale. So you actually, you have less, you don't have to service as much. You technically have less clients, you're just lending more money to less people. <laughs> so um, it's technically, in terms of a P&L thing, you should see scale. Um, in terms of risk thing, though, this could be a problem down the road if it were to continue for a long period of time. Here you might just want to freeze frame this. It's on and off balance sheet loans. Really, in my point of view, it's just harder uh, for transparency reasons to really dig into off balance sheet loans. So we're going to go to the balance sheet in a bit, and you can see that's hard to tell. Like it looks like their assets are just way outpaced their uh, loans, the liability side, and part of that is because of this odd balance sheet loan growth. Here they basically say the third party commercial banks, we determine that we're not the primary obliger in the lending relationship and do not record financing receivables from such loans. For certain off balance sheet loans, we're obliged to compensate for some financial funding partners for the principal and interest payment to the loans in the event of the user default. It's so basically to say they're on the hook if the user defaults. So say if they lend money out to somebody, they can't pay. Lex and Fintech's on the hook, not the uh, funder. Um, but again, the funder's only probably getting 6%, whereas this company's getting 24% from the user, right? So <laughs> they're getting compensated to take this risk, but it is a risk that's on this company's books, so Lex and Fintech's book. Here's just a snapshot of the financial position. So the balance sheet, and you can see they do have quite a bit of cash relative to the market cap. You, you, if you were to scan this, that, okay, this screen is really cheap. And they have limited... Um, short-term borrowings. They do have a convertible that they just paid off in April 2024, so that's a good thing because it'll help simplify it in the future, but <laughs> they do have long-term borrowings as well on the business side. Now one of the things, I think we've done a bank, but I can't remember. Um, anyway, we kind of talked, I think at some point, about short-term contract assets and receivables. So that's kind of you lending out money, and this is you getting funding from somebody. That's on balance sheet. Now, off balance sheet, <laughs> don't have a clue. You can see here they have 3.2 billion US technically of total assets on the balance sheet, but they only have 1.89 billion of liabilities, which would imply that the equity has been, this company has been making money hand over fist for years, um, right? Because normally this would be uh, some function of paid in capital and retained earnings, which is so positive. Um, but we don't technically know that, right? <laughs> and the stock, stock price says otherwise, right? This thing's gone down for a reason. So I would take balance sheet with a grain of salt. It does screen strong, but again, 
part of this because of the off balance sheet liabilities. We don't really have an idea of how strong it is. So that's always frustrating. Um, in terms of the operating revenue, we kind of talked about the three segments at the beginning of this video. But you can see the main driver inside the, the business at 75% of the income now, the credit facilitation, is this loan facilitation and services and fees oriented. So that's your five billion of your thirteen billion or MB sales. So a huge portion of it. And again, the first thing they flag for this one is again this linked to off balance sheet loans. So this off balance sheet loan strategy is critical to the current growth profile of the company. Um, so it needs to, that's why I'm bringing it up so much. Not just because of the little off balance sheet boogie man. No, this is it's because it's key to the business model. It's key to the recent growth as well. So I just want to point that out, make sure that it's clear. <laughs> and again, they reference, we take all the credit risk of borrowers in respect of off balance sheet loans through relevant guarantee arrangements. That's that part. Um, if I break down the 5 billion a little bit more, so this 500181 is from here. If I break that down just a little bit more, you can see it breaks into loan facilitation and matching services. So again, it's matching founder to the younger kids. So these guys are basically acting as the middleman. And here they kind of say what exactly that entails. So again, they provide engineering services to the borrowers and funding partners as the lenders. The intermediary services provided include loan facilitation and matching, post origination services, which they say is uh, they charge for account maintenance, collection, and payment processing. And they also will touch on a financial guarantee. Okay, we're going to take the responsibility if this loan goes sideways. Uh, I just want to make that clear. It's, it's the biggest part of the revenue side. Um, in terms of operating cost, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So we'll see this when we go right into the PL in a bit. But you can see really there's three main items it is your provisions, which are the ones that uh, shot up in 2023, your processing and services costs, which is relatively flat. Like the business actually grew quite a bit, over the, especially since from 2023 versus 2022. And we'll go we'll on that in a second. And the cost of sales also scaled very well. It's actually gone down, even though the revenue growth shot up. Um, part of that, I think, is because they have less active users, <laughs> um, but they're lending more to them. So I think that's part of the scale of showing up here. That's just my opinion. So you basically have a couple costs. You have funding costs that actually went down year over year because the government's trying to promote spending as well. So you have basically three of the bigger, I'd say, cost parts actually going down while revenue shooting up, <laughs> recovering rather, but you have this one, which is starting to balloon. And so the trick is you don't know how big the contingent liability for the provision, the PCL, if you were say a uh, Canadian bank or American bank, how long these uh, provisions for credit losses will, will go on for. Was this this peak or are we gonna see more of this and it's gonna offset some more growth? Now, the company actually did quite well in 2023 versus 2022, but so far the SOX uh, hasn't reacted to that improvement at all. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do the video now, because it does look like it's inflected, but we don't technically know that. And the biggest question is going to be how big is this um, provision for <laughs> future credit losses get? Now, it should be getting bigger because almost all the loan growth is being driven by third party funding. So they should be getting this up more. But again, it's just um, when does that stop or at least when does that slow down in terms of a percent of the overall book in terms of total loans outstanding. So that's the for this company, from my point of view, that's the bigger, the biggest question. Um, there is also the sales so they have to attract, right, more users. So there is some part of that there, but again, there's relatively scale. I mean, this mine has gone up, but it's gone up a lot less than the revenue growth has over the last couple of years, especially over the last year. So again, I think a part of that is just linked to um, the actual active users going down over year. Um, in terms of the negative, so they do have here, it's probably the most important part. So they have two institutional funding partners that accounted for more than 10% of the company's total funding cost. And you can see that funding shot up, basically doubled for both of them. They used to only be about a third of the business altogether. And now they're 70% of the funding is coming from these two companies. So this is huge um, business model risk especially because we don't know exactly who they are. <laughs> and it's also the reason why the company's growing as well as it has. If these two companies stop giving them as much money or whatever, um, it'd be bad. If one of these companies, something negative happens, the headline is something knows what the company is, this company's also getting whacked. 
right? So I, I kind of want to dig into who these two partners are. I'm sure they're Chinese-owned banks, but they're not disclosed, or at least not that I could readily find. What else is there? This is just their slide. Again, they referenced they have 150 funny partners, but we just saw a slide that basically said, well, uh, kind of, but I mean, two of them represent 70% of our international funding. So um, anyway, I found most of the slides in the presentation deck use, so that's why we're going through much on that 20F, as it's just way better information. In terms of when they recognize the revenue, they say their intermediary services provided include loan facilitation matching services. We kind of talked about those three things. Now, they, we identify loan facilitation, matching services, and the post originate services as distinct and separate from the performance obligations. The financial guarantee is recorded at the fair value at inception of each loan. So once the loan is originated and they have it, then they're on the hook with the guarantee it to the, the funder. Um, then they're booking the revenue right then and there, whatever the guarantee is worth. Revenues from the loan facilitation and matching services are recognized at a point in time upon the successful matching of the loans. So they recognize it um, again at the loan inception once they do the matchmaker service. <laughs> and then revenues from the post originates service to recognize over time of the loan, so the term of the loan. So uh, it's actually depending on how much they get paid up front for finding a place to put the money that they're getting funding from. Um, this is probably a big, could be, could be a way to abuse it. It's hard to tell because you do need to find somebody. But ultimately, if they're going to be recognizing the revenue earlier, and so you're obviously you just lump the money so you don't think they're in credit default, so your um, credit provision is going to be low, but you're recognizing a lot of revenue from doing the matchmaking part up front, and you're recognizing a portion over the life of the loan that they actually pay it off with the interest, right? So anyway, um, that's worth pointing out as well. In terms of the actual P&L, you can see the business actually put up better numbers than 2021 and 2022. So despite the share price pretty much hovering off the lows or relatively low to it, especially what it used to be worth, this business actually looks better year over year. And it's scaled across, again, the top three um, operating cost lines. The only one that's um, being a headwind for them is the provision for credit losses. The business overall has been relatively profitable. You can see that they have been paying down buying back shares actually a decent amount so that we are seeing some cash remuneration actually just started a big dividend we'll go into that at the end of the video but there is it's not like this business isn't performing it's just the share price isn't performing <laughs> and i think a part of it is because of this worry on who the funders are um as well as the credit provision risk um which kind of gets me excited but at the same time i can see why they're afraid <laughs> right it's, it's hard to exactly know exactly what you're getting into um, you can see here the, the growth, it, it's been high, but again, it's been driven hugely by the loan facilitation and servicing fees, which again is the third party financing or international funding rather. And again, you can see it primary due to the increase of balance sheet loans originated under the credit oriented model. And they also some, they flag that they have better control over early repayment behavior. So one of the things, this is kind of interesting for people that don't know, but in banks, there's a thing called repayment risk, like in mortgages, like to say for my mortgage for this place, they only allow you to prepay an X amount a year. At least in my case, it's about twenty-eight thousand a year that I'm allowed to prepay. And if I try to pay any more off early, not allowed. And that's how they manage prepayment risk. In this company's case, it's a lot shorter. They only have twelve months, so basically they want them to pay or take the full duration out um, to pay them back, so they get the most amount of money they can, while also ensuring that the um, the end user can actually pay them with that pretty steep interest, right, twenty-three percent a year. So. Um, I just thought that was worth pointing out. Funding costs, like I've already mentioned, has gone down year over year, even though revenue has been going up. They also mentioned that the processing the service costs um, actually showed really good scale and primarily due to increase in risk management and collection expenses. So you can see the charge offs are all over the place. This chart is really noisy, it doesn't really help you much. You can see right now they're at 5.6% for the 30 day, and for the 90 day, they're at 2.9. So it is getting worse. So Either their underwriting standards are getting worse or things are getting worse in China for younger kids. And we do know that unemployment in China has been a sore part for the last, uh, really, for the last, more than the last year. That's worth bringing up here. That that's one of the reasons why the PCLs are increasing is likely because um, it's getting harder for these kids to find jobs after university. Um, well, that's just conjecture. In terms of the cash flow statement, I mean, I'm happy they have it, but it's two pages long. So it's really noisy. So you, this is a profitable business, um, which you can see 
they add back to provisions because technically they're not cash you're providing for something that you're planning to write off ahead of time. Um, so they do have a large amount of provisions that they're adding back. Um, and really, at the end of the day, they have a lot of working capital noise, <laughs> a lot. Um, but anyway, you can see, historically speaking, it has been a CFO positive. Last year was actually really positive, especially relative to the current value of the company. <laughs> this is an American dollar since last column, $392 million. In terms of, so investing is always going to have the source of funding and how much you're getting paid back in terms of principal, so principal collection. Your financing receivables should always similarly offset each other, at least go up and down together at the same time. And here you can see the financing. So what are they doing with the money? Here you can see um, they did prepay or repay uh, a large amount of convertible loans in 2023, and they did and they did start the dividend policy, and they did repurchase stocks in 2022 a decent amount again, relative to the company's size currently. So they are starting some remuneration for shareholders, but it's early on, is what I'd say. And I did want to see like who the <laughs> who exactly the convertible notes were. And it does look like this company, Lemongrass Holding One, um, were paid in full on April 2024. So we'll, we'll see this for the next quarter as well. But um, it looks like it's finally behind that, which maybe makes the business a little bit less convoluted. I've skipped through a lot of the detail on how this thing's structured. It's a, it's a total mess, um, <laughs> and, it's, and it is hard to dig through. Um, and this video is already longer than I wanted it to be, but I'm going as fast as I can. They do flag in the fourth quarter that the industry has faced challenges due to slow recovery of macroeconomic with credit demand and intensified competition. They claim that they're starting to take um, some more risk management to improve the I say the credit provision side, they claim that they have an increase of 35% credit approval rate and a 10% decrease in the risk of level of new consumer loans, aka they think that they've improved the ability to lend while also increasing the bar um, that the consumer is less likely to default. We don't know if that's true or not, so they said. This is probably more interesting for me is the funding cost. So we, we talked about how, we already talked about the APRs at 23%, right? Um, and the average loan is now 12.3 months. But you can see right here, you can see the funding costs is recorded. Historically low funding costs is 6.18, down 63 bips year over year. Um, funding costs at a new low, below 6% now in February, and expect this downward trend to continue. So we're seeing the funding cost side continue to go down, while well, they're still charging a relatively high amount on the APR side. Um, so they're, they're getting this pretty good spread as long as they can control the credit losses. This company looks really good, right? That, that's what I'm trying to get at with this part. They do have a dividend payout ratio. Right now they have 0.182 US dollar per ADS, basically a 10% dividend yield based on the year end closing price of 2022. We do expect the annual amount for this full year to be 2024 to be no less than last year. They do expect net profit to improve year over year in 2024 versus 2023. So we should see EPS growth with continued revenue growth, but we don't know that. It's really going to come down to the credit provisions. But technically, in terms of the business, it looks like it's scaling really well. A part of that, I think, is just there lending to less people more. <laughs> so the average loan balance is going up, but the less there's less active people. Um, so it's showing scale on their side. Um, obviously, um, charging 23.7% when your funding costs are going down below six. It's also going to be lucrative for these guys, but we'll have to see this play through. The dividend yield is high. It, they just started paying it. Um, in terms of some positives to end the video on, the CEO and the president are aligned. Um, you can see 24% of shares outstanding, 7.5% of shares outstanding, and then you have percentage voting power. The CEO still has pretty much higher lock on voting power. Um, here's the dividend policy. So here they do say our board directors approved a semi-annual cash dividend policy, semi-annual, approximately 15 to 30% of our net profit in the prior six-month period. So that's a very high dividend for what the current share price is at and the trade so cheaply. So assuming they can keep their net profit relatively high, even last year wasn't amazing by any means, but it was a recovery. I think you're getting a 10% divvy. Um, if they can sustain that, it is interesting that they're trying to, and this is one of the things I would pick up on China before most of the market finally did, is that they're starting to change more into more shareholder remuneration. So more money for investors 
mean, partially because so much capital has left China over the last three years, I think. <laughs> and I think this is another company that's doing that. And then also we do have the share buybacks, right? So weighted average number of standing diluted is going down quite a bit over time as well. We have seen some shareholder buybacks, but we haven't seen any lately. They've decided to focus on dividends instead, even though given where the share price is trading, I would much prefer to see buybacks. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> anyway, I would like to know your thoughts on this company. It's uh, a little bit complicated. It's interesting. And obviously, it's uh, China, small cap that's left for bed. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'd like to know your thoughts and have a great rest of your weekend.